Welcome to HealthCast. I'm your host, Adam Patterson. We are joined today by Dr. Leonard Pogash, an endocrinologist and decades-long diabetes expert at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Dr. Pogash has dedicated his career to advancing diabetes care, particularly the groundbreaking work at Veterans Affairs to innovate more effective and less invasive diabetes management that broadly improves the quality of life and health outcomes for patients suffering from both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Dr. Pogash, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm anxious to speak to you on behalf of the VHA today. Yeah, absolutely. It is it is fantastic to have you, especially on such an impactful topic. And before we dive into the real meat and substance of your research work, I'm curious, can you give us a bit of background on your career and your research interests and what first brought you to your current role at VA? Sure. So I've been in the VA 41 years, uh, right out of fellowship. It's been my only, um, the only uh, employer I've worked for in a variety of roles. Um, I decided to join the VA out of fellowship because I wanted to be able to serve patients and not have to worry about uh, finances, you know, billing and receipts. And I also wanted to do teaching and I wanted to do research. And I trained at uh, Temple University Hospital and Boston City Hospital in part, which are very much public health hospitals um, in um, uh, neighborhoods that do not have medical care. And it's something that I felt was a um, something I wanted to do in my career. So um, initially I started as a staff physician um, and uh, became a, a chief of endocrinology over the years. I wound up having a, um, a developing and uh, getting a health services research center back in about the, the early 2000s and um, had a 10 year career doing that. And then I was asked to um, uh, be at VACO in 2012 uh, in a policy position, which would include diabetes, also medical service, now I'm just diabetes. And I thought that would be an interesting opportunity. So in, in all the years before, um, I had, when I first got to East Orange in 1981, um, they had a number of veterans sitting in the, uh, the um, uh, outside the hospital and uh, many of them had amputations or had decreased vision. And I thought this was what war was about. Uh, this back then they had a Korean War veterans, World War II veterans. Uh, but I quickly learned that um, this was largely diabetes. And, um, and this was the result of untreated diabetes. Back in 1981, uh, we live in an age of miracles now. Back in 1981, that wasn't quite the case. There weren't really effective medications. We had a MPH insulin, regular insulin. We had a first generation oral hyperglycemic agents. Uh, the A1C test was um, uh, not standardized then. Individuals uh, had to basically uh, almost cut their finger with a knife for sub, uh, uh, self monitoring of blood glucose. And, and much we know what we know about now and how to prevent the complications of diabetes clearly wasn't known. So, one of the first things I did in the early years, in the early mid 80s, is that the uh, nurse at our uh, facility uh, was very interested in developing diabetes self management education uh, so that patients could be taught how to manage themselves. And, and I was exposed to that as a fellow. And I thought this is a great idea. Uh, she became, we became, thanks to her, the first ADA recognized program in the federal government in 1988 or 1989. And uh, our director liked it because the veterans liked it. And um, we expanded. And um, uh, we went down and back then the VA had four regions. Uh, I forget exactly what they were, but ours went from Maine down to Washington, D.C. and probably uh, through Pennsylvania, and the regional director liked it. So uh, our nurse said, if you fund me for a year, I will get every facility ADA recognized, and she did. Uh, so that was the beginning of, of my interest and my passion for diabetes self-management education uh, that I continue to the uh, present, and we'll talk about that uh, later. So um, over time, I was a clinician, and um, I was certainly very interested in all aspects of diabetes um, education. And then as a result of our, my interest in education, I got to be the national program director in 1980, 1991. And um, in the mid-1990s, when Dr. Kaiser was in, I wrote an uh, email to on an old computer uh, back to someone uh, say, you know, in our office saying, you know, diabetes is a, is a great disease for primary care management of, of chronic disease. You know, this is primarily something that 
internists can do uh, along with dietitians uh, and uh, nurses. Uh, pharmacists were not as prominent as they are now, but certainly now to the effort and we need education. The next thing I knew, uh, Dr. Kaiser appointed me to lead guidelines uh, in 1995 and be on a national development committee for um, performance measures. So um, the VA DOD, they weren't the DOD back then, though they were involved, other federal agencies were involved. Back in, they were published in 1997, and our approach was not a one size fits all, but based on the evidence at the time to try and develop target goals, ranges for individual veterans to try and meet uh, the benefits of tight control versus um, non-tight control, which back then was still evolving. Uh, that became uh, better understood in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, but we never advocated for tight control for everyone because the studies that were out there from um, the United Kingdom, uh, later a VA study, um, and others showed that the benefit was over about a 10 year period of time. It was largely early microvascular disease, so retinopathy in your eye or a peripheral um, disease in your feet, which while troubling, um, it, there was no evidence of preventing long term complications simply because in 10 years from the onset of disease, it didn't happen. So we basically put in that it's up to shared decision making, it's up to the clinician, the clinician team, and the patient to make a decision well, how intensively do you want to treat your diabetes? Uh, as I mentioned back then, it was pretty difficult to achieve the levels that we've achieved now without significant hypoglycemia. It still is a challenge. And um, so we became the first evidence-based uh, practice guideline for diabetes, I believe, as opposed to just consensus, and we implemented performance measures. Uh, Ken Kaiser was very big on performance measures. So starting in 1997, we basically um, a routine foot screening for every uh, person with diabetes, every veteran with diabetes, once a year using a simple uh, monofilament, a retinopathy screening, and um, by an eye doctor, and uh, also getting an A1C test, looking at the blood pressure, uh, looking at the lipids. Um, the values changed slight, slightly over time. So we were, uh, to my knowledge, certainly a first federal agency, and because we did it right away, probably one of the first agencies or uh, organizations in the country to implement their performance measures. And Ken Kaiser put the data out and people reacted to it. But so back then, diabetes was very poorly controlled in all aspects. And within three or four years, um, most patients were getting more appropriate care. Um, next thing I knew, the uh, HSRD Health Services Research uh, Division. Uh, wanted me to become the clinical coordinator of um, the query, which is the Quality Enhancement Research Initiative. And uh, I got the first uh, query grant for foot care uh, to try and see what the clinicians were doing, what the, the patients were doing, try and put systems together. Uh, the Back then we had the National Center for Clinical Care. Uh, no, um, I think it was the NCCC, whatever, it was a different name than the current um, uh, clinical commission, but they, um, the for cost containment, National Center for Cost Containment, and uh, a um, uh, individual there developed a database for foot outcomes. So, uh, uh, along with uh, some other aspects, so we actually had a database back in the late 1990s uh, to be able to monitor people having amputations as well as some other aspects of diabetes, uh, and obviously that got improved on over time. Um, computers have improved, data analysis has improved. So pretty much in 1999 uh, era, we were doing all of this. And then the Johnson Clinic, probably around 2000, 2002, uh, developed non-midriatic um, retinal screening. Uh, so that meant instead of having to see an eye doctor in uh, the eye doctor's office and you dilated your eyes, you sat in the office, what people do now, I mean, if you really have significant eye disease or just for your go for your routine ophthalmology exam, even if you don't have diabetes, uh, you could look into a machine and the machine was able to take a picture of your retina and uh, trained retinal photographers, this was a Jocelyn model, um, were able to uh, look at the pictures and determine if you had retinopathy and grade it, um, call it human artificial intelligence, if you might. And uh, they were able to um, decide if it was no retinopathy, mild retinopathy, 
you know, or severe retinopathy and have you go see a ophthalmologist. If some patients did need laser therapy. But remember, um, back then, many patients still are rural. There weren't ophthalmologists at every facility. And uh, this was an opportunity to stratify patients into high, moderate, low risk, or, or at that time, no disease. And to, uh, without any ophthalmologist touching a patient uh, and just doing it via photography. And obviously, we, they still had to communicate with ophthalmologists in either fee basis or going to a, a secondary tertiary community, you were able to get appropriate care. So that's sort of the early beginnings of um, guidelines, early beginnings of performance measures, early beginning of, um, of performance measurement. And uh, the era that we're in now uh, is certainly a lot different. And I presume that's what we're going to talk about today. It's um, uh, now uh, two, two and a half decades later. And uh, really, the it, it, as I mentioned, I could not have envisioned this uh, at that time. Absolutely. And you presume correctly that we're very much going to talk about the, the current era of diabetes care. But it sounds like all those advancements, especially that you've been involved with over the past few decades, a few years at least, have been I would imagine particularly impactful for the quality of American healthcare as a whole, because if my understanding is correct, diabetes is one of the most commonly managed um, chronic health conditions seen in the United States among both civilians and veterans. And again, as a, from a total layman's understanding, if memory serves, there are again, two kinds of diabetes, type one diabetes and type two diabetes. And before we get into the more modernized approaches to care, I'm curious, what are the particular risk factors and uh, precipitators for developing type one and type two diabetes respectively? Yeah, it's actually a bit more complicated than that, but um, type one diabetes is classically viewed as a autoimmune disease, um, usually alone, but often sometimes with other autoimmune diseases. And what happens is the body makes uh, antibodies to the uh, beta cells in the pancreas, the beta cells secrete insulin. So effectively over time, the beta cells are destroyed. Um, and patients have a complete reliance on, on insulin. Uh, sometimes this can happen suddenly without warning. It's uh, more prevalent in children than it is in adults, uh, but it's now recognized that um, uh, autoimmune diabetes, uh, was often referred to as type one diabetes, uh, can occur in later years. Um, and in fact, it's um, been documented to occur in in the, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and people 80 years of age. So it's basically the, the latent onset of type 1 diabetes. Uh, in addition, type 2 diabetes, and, and now that clearly there's also different um, genetics, people are now trying to better understand how to modulate the immune so, uh, system in children. Uh, there was one case reported of a um, pancreatic beta cell transplant uh, in the past year. Uh, which uh, the individual uh, who was volunteered for it had had type 1 diabetes for years, and at least over, I forget what it was, maybe a year or so, was off insulin and doing well. Um, so that's not quite what we're talking about. That is a advance far beyond uh, what we're talking about today, but there's been tremendous strides. Type 2 diabetes, in comparison, has typically been viewed as a disease, usually of overweight individuals, uh, but not only individuals are overweight because it's not the only risk factor, but it's often genetics, uh, the syndrome of metabolic resistance. So frequently, um, individuals with what we call type 2 diabetes often have hypertension, high cholesterol, overweight um, associated with it, and there's often a very strong family history. Uh, so this is classically what's been referred to as type 2 diabetes, although some patients with type 2 may actually have a type 1. Um, but over time, with over many, many years, you know, 10, 15 years of uncontrolled hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, uh, the pancreatic cell, the beta cells in the pancreas begin to fail. And people and, and patients begin to develop a, a lack of response to high blood sugar. And, and some become what we call insulinopenic. They, uh, it's not autoimmune disease, but they no longer can make adequate insulin uh, and they wind up needing insulin. Uh, and frequently because they are overweight, and in addition to being overweight, they also um, have um, uh, insulin resistance, perhaps genetically. Uh, individuals often wind up on, uh, before the more recent medications were developed, on you know two, three shots of insulin a day, a long-acting and 
and pain to try and keep their blood sugar on control. And but we do have newer options just in the past couple of years. Um, another major aspect is pancreatic injury. Um, alcoholism is a major cause of, uh, probably the most common cause in America of pancreatitis. Um, and uh, if people have multiple episodes, they develop chronic pancreatitis, in which case uh, the pancreas is um, damaged and they uh, can't make, uh, the beta cells don't make insulin, but frequently uh, the individuals can't make proper uh, hormones for um, um, absorption and can wind up with GI problems independently of, of, of diabetes. And, and there's all sorts of other different types of diabetes that are genetic that are coming out. So, um, but I think we classically still think of autoimmune diabetes, uh, type one, type two diabetes being insulin resistant and um, uh, pancreatic damage. We can also include medication sometimes as being sort of the way most people probably view it. But the molecular biology, the genetics is advancing knowledge. Uh, um, it's not daily, at least monthly or yearly. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like the ongoing research projects, again, I'm assuming a significant amount of which is happening at BA are really helping again elucidate the various complexities of how diabetes exists as a condition and how it, how it manifests in various ways. Which brings me to my next question, because you touched a bit on how diabetes has typically been diagnosed and managed, you know, the more, one could say, I guess, invasive or less efficient ways of monitoring, for example, glucose levels and the like. I'm wondering, especially in terms of what you're helping oversee and use at VA, what new device and capacities, like, for example, continuous glucose monitors, has VA begun providing to diabetes patients to better help manage their condition? Right. So first off, the advances in diabetes. So diabetes is just not a disease of, of hyperglycemia. Um, it's a disease that, as I mentioned, is associated with type 2 for individuals uh, with cardiovascular disease um, as well, hypertension, uh, high lipids uh, that have to be managed. Individuals who have high blood sugar over time, either they're type 1 or type 2 or whatever, uh, eventually they will develop uh, progressive risk factors for the end-stage complications, the amputations, the uh, proliferative retinopathy, loss of vision that are referred to um, before uh, kidney failure. This occurs over many, many years. Usually, um, although there's some people may be pre uh, um, genetically predisposed, this usually happens over decades of, of poor control. And so that's why tight, uh, tighter control of blood sugar is important for individuals who have a longer lifespan. Um, as far as the, um, so we can talk about, I'll, I'll put the uh, continuous glucose monitoring on the, um, uh, in the parking lot for a minute. So one of the things that can be done is how do we manage the other diseases as well, or the other complications? So I mentioned the um, uh, example of uh, uh, photography, you know, non-midriatic um, photography, and now we can do many things remotely. So patients, um, uh, can see eye doctors by telehealth, uh, and uh, they can uh, get retinal examinations. So you no longer need to come to uh, the outpatient clinic for this. Uh, is it as F and the data would suggest that in general, it's pretty darn good compared to the uh, optometrist or ophthalmologist in their clinic. Obviously, if you have significant disease, uh, you might need a someone to, to care for you uh, in, in person and do a more depth examination. Um, for a uh, foot exam, you know, for um, blood pressure control, blood pressure control is now monitoring. We have, um, while there's automatic devices for uh, validation, uh, nurse man nurses are trained to basically call the patient up. Uh, they watch the patient take their blood pressure. They've had a proper uh, cup fitting. And uh, then they show the uh, nurse the blood pressure result. So that can also be done remotely nowadays. Um, for quite a while, we've had um, uh, uh, blood glucose monitoring devices. Many of those are automated uh, as well. And uh, those data can also be provided to the um, uh, either remotely or patients can, uh, if they don't uh, monitor frequently, uh, can give that information to the clinician. So to a large extent, we are based diabetes is moving to a telehealth oriented uh, condition. For foot care, um, if patients do have um, uh, early neuropathy, uh, veterans, if they have a problem with their feet, uh, can take a picture 
and upload that. And uh, effectively, the uh, a clinician can look and see if this is something that they can just be, the, the patient can just be told, look, take a look at it, look at your feet every day, several times a day, make sure it's not getting worse. Or, um, yeah, you better come into the hot, you know, you better come into the outpatient clinic. And not everything can be managed, but at least in that way, individuals can um, get a sense, do I need to, and many patients are rural, do I need to drive the 30 miles? Or if they live in a city, they might not have transportation. So again, this is uh, decreasing the burden of, um, of um, inpatient visits for the management of um, diabetes. Now, one innovation, and, and we can talk more about it later, is for veterans who are very high risk for developing a foot ulcer. Uh, these are usually patients who've already had a foot ulcer uh, or have significant vascular disease, uh, peripheral artery disease, um, pain in their legs when they walk. Uh, they can be given a device in which if they stand on it, it can measure a temperature gradient uh, that would be indicative of um, underlying inflammation underneath the skin. And they can be advised to actually, apparently I haven't used it, but uh, my uh, the head of podiatry tells me it actually gives you a uh, message, uh, email message that you know to stay off your feet. Uh, one of the first treatments for a early problem in your foot is uh, rest. And um, if it's not improving uh, or if it gets worse, then I think it can send you another message and clearly this could be monitored. So um, these are ways in which um, uh, some of the diabetes-specific um, complications um, can now be managed remotely. Now, in that context, you know, continuous glucose monitoring devices are uh, the database is uh, best for patients who have been insulinopenic. So what we would call the type one or longstanding type two, uh, who require multiple uh, doses of insulin daily. Um, to keep their blood pressure under control and may be more prone to hypoglycemia. Individuals who are um, uh, without insulin, insulinopenic, as I mentioned, really can't auto-regulate their, uh, their body can't auto-regulate their blood sugar. Therefore, they have marked swings. And uh, that is the, uh, a, the type of, uh, of um, patient for whom uh, continuous glucose monitoring can help avoid uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, similarly, those patients have, because they have wide swings, also are at risk, you know, if they tightly try to tightly regulate your blood sugar, it leads to hypoglycemia. So it's, you know, e either way, the continuous monitoring devices has been a, um, a, a boon for individuals who have to inject themselves daily, who have to constantly uh, check their blood sugar to see how much insulin to give. Uh, in, in many instances, they might be healthy and uh, going out for, uh, for a run. Uh, Many uh, uh, veterans who are younger, healthier, and uh, uh, patients throughout the country, you know, still like to exercise. There are individuals who are um, uh, apparently Olympic uh, athletes um, who can, can, you know, monitor themselves. So, but for the average person, I don't think the average person is an uh, Olympic athlete. Certainly, they can engage in most normal activities of life. They can have a glucose monitoring device that uh, obviates the need for close control. I mean, for constantly doing blood glucose monitoring. And, and some individuals may be in positions where, you know, they have a job that, uh, you know, they're going up on a ladder and or they uh, are driving a, a vehicle. I know in certain instances you are going to be dividing uh, having a commercial vehicle, uh, you know, interstate travel if you have type 1 diabetes, but it really allows them to um, be unshackled from the need to monitor all the time. So this field is also evolving rapidly. It's uh, the um, devices have not been around for that long and people, uh, the researchers are trying to get a bird. So clearly the, the boon to the patient is obvious. You know, the question will be what happens long-term? Um, what does this mean in terms of outcomes? Uh, because it's, uh, that requires a longer period of time. I think that it will require, uh, you know, more research to um, delineate what is the impact on the complications of diabetes, variability, things like that, and that's obviously ongoing. Uh, with the variety, with research, uh, certainly from the NIH and professional societies, et cetera. So that's sort of a long-winded answer, but I hope it sort of gives you a sense of what C how CGM is impacting uh, the quality of life for for patients now and what the future might be uh, might be
Definitely. And it sounds like a lot of these things really dovetail nicely with VA's focus on, as you mentioned, expanding telehealth, you know, expanding access uh, to rural, you know, access to rural veterans, really finding ways to provide a certain degree of continuity of care and services to veterans who might not otherwise have access. So it's really nice to see those things come together. And in terms of, again, the way things are going forward and, and your more forward looking projects, I want to ask as a final question here, what kind of ongoing research projects and technical innovation programs is VA currently uh, overseeing that will help further advance diabetes management going forward? So um, uh, from HSRD, a lot of the uh, research which is being funded by health services research right now um, is based upon the, um, the ability of the veterans, you know, which patients is telehealth good for? Uh, as you saw on the um, Zoom today, um, it takes a little bit of practice, um, but most people can get the hang of it. Um, but for assuming that patients are able to, veterans are able to get onto the uh, VA network, what can be done? How can they use perhaps some more uh, advanced imaging? Um, but also, uh, when is, it's very clear. Uh, the VA, um, uh, patient health based now development in which um, all of these uh, devices eventually uh, will be able to be in a single database that will be accessible uh, by clinicians. Um, I'm not an informaticist uh, in that regard, but uh, it's um, developing uh, the and uh, has to go through um, uh, OIT and other uh, aspects of the VA for each device to make sure that it meets the requirements, and then the, uh, they will have to build the system. Uh, but hopefully within a uh, short time horizon, uh, patient-derived patient data will be available um, uh, at the enterprise level. In addition to the um, uh, glucose monitoring, uh, that could also include self-reported data. We have a um, project in the VA called ANI. Uh, it was called Annie because it came from uh, Britain. It was named after a nurse. I forget the exact details. Uh, but patients can um, record their blood pressures at home uh, on a daily basis. They can record their um, blood glucose monitoring results at home. Um, and uh, that can link to the um, clinician. So uh, for patients who um, uh, are on less complicated regimens, they can take their own uh, blood pressure, they can take their uh, blood sugar results, and um, let's say they have a cold, uh, you know, they, uh, that's available um, to the clinician taking care of them or the clinical team. Um, so all that data, again, could be put eventually into, the, um, into a patient-derived uh, database. Um, so I, I think making that uh, what the patient is saying, not at the time of a visit, uh, not on a telephone call, um, but it, if it's not acute, and again, uh, that might be a simple follow-up if you want, uh, we want patients to be aware of acute signs and symptoms. Uh, if you have a small, if you think you have a red spot on the sole of your foot, on your toe, we want you to call. You could send a photograph, as I mentioned before, why? Um, an infection can develop rapidly. We don't want you to wait till the next day when it's developed. You may have you might say you need to come in, you need to be on an antibiotic. I, I don't know if you've heard the tone floaters, but um, they're very common even in people without diabetes. Uh, it's a little bit of the retina sort of flicking off, but patients who have a significant retina disease for any reason, and we're certainly talking diabetes, uh, if they have a floater, it could be an early symptom or certain early sign, not a symptom, of diabetic retinopathy that might need urgent um, laser therapy. Um, and um, there's all sorts of in between patients. Again, it's just not the uh, retinopathy or the peripheral neuropathy, but um, uh, heart attacks and strokes are more common in people with diabetes. And we want all veterans to understand that um, if you feel differently, you you know, a heart attack is just not the crushing pain in your chest. Uh, it could be um, a bit of a heaviness. It could be that you're feeling tired. Uh, you're not feeling well. You can't do what you're used to doing. Maybe in today's area, thinking, do I have COVID? Uh, or something else is going on. Or 
you're a man and uh, frequently most of our veterans are, you might just, you know, uh, slide it off. Um, but we want patients to be aware of early symptoms uh, that might be indicative of an impending problem. Uh, feeling a little bit dizzy, it's not going away. So part of what we want to try and do is in the patients, and this is, we don't have personalized precision medicine as oncology does. I'm a bit jealous that you can target um, uh, antigens on a um, cancer and and uh, treat it with um, new um, antibodies, uh, a new um, uh, medications that can block the uh, uh, the um, chemicals from the cancer. But still, we need to be able to have a bit more precision than what we're doing. And uh, it certainly might be possible for in addition to what we're talking about, we want patients to at least be aware of what the symptoms are because it's not precision medicine. And if you speak a different language, you come from a different culture, uh, your language might be, be different. Uh, we're using terms and the patient doesn't understand it, then need to, need to understand it. So I do want to get into diabetes self-management education, but I want to stop here to see if I answered your question. Absolutely, and very uh, thoroughly so. I want to ask one final question before we wrap up, and that is, is there anything else you would like our listeners or veterans to know specifically about what they can access in terms of VA's diabetes care and what resources they have available for them right now? Right. Well, that can, can link to the diabetes health management education. So telehealth is something they definitely need to ask about. So they need to have a primary care team. The primary care team is the, um, the bulwark for diabetes care. We can certainly... Uh, have consults with people remotely now, specialists, uh, to get advice. So they don't necessarily have to see a specialist and go in person. Uh, and some people will need to be managed more carefully uh, if they have more advanced disease. And as I mentioned, some people will wind up needing some more of the new technical um, advances. But I do want to mention education because that is often not valued and underrated. Um, patients really need to know how to manage their own care. They need to know these, uh, the signs they should look for, the symptoms they need to look for, and be proactive about doing it. Because I mentioned often it's something which is sudden. And uh, if you don't get care initially, it could develop into something worse. Uh, they need, for example, hypertension management starts with a diet, DASH diet, a, a diet that's um, low on salt, uh, that everybody should try and, and implement. If you're using the salt shaker, that's not good. Um, individuals need to know um, also about the signs and symptoms of high and low uh, blood sugar. So, um, and they need to understand what their medications are, how to take them. Frequently, uh, people may not be aware, they might not remember, and, and constant repetition is important. And what we're doing recently is to emphasize stress and diabetes. Many people with diabetes have stress for a variety of reasons, just not the diabetes or social, economic situation, but stress can have a very negative impact upon diabetes management. You can elevate your blood sugar because of all the hormones. And the VA has a whole health initiative, which is also used with post-traumatic stress, where veterans can be referred for uh, things such as yoga, uh, mindful meditation, uh, and other um, aspects which can help release their, uh, relieve their stress and help manage their blood sugar. It's what they can do at home. It's not a medication. It's something they can get into, in fact, if they have family support, that's even better. So we're very big on patient education, and we can do that remotely um, uh, through a variety of uh, mechanisms. We have an avatar-based system uh, that was just developed, which is still in progress of developing. But still, the phone, the phone works, telehealth works for, for everything just about. Absolutely. And that all sounds really promising. It sounds like especially the advances of telehealth combined with these increasingly technically sophisticated means of monitoring and, and addressing the condition is leading to a, a wide uh, improvement in health outcomes and, and quality of life for veterans with diabetes. So this is all incredibly promising to hear. And uh, Dr. Pogash, I just want to thank you for coming onto the program and sharing your expertise. Thank you very much and come back in a year. I'm hopefully that we have a lot more for you. HealthCast, along with GovCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. 
You can follow all of them in your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at gcio.com.